Gresham's Law is a monetary principle that says bad money drives out good money. And this is a concept that goes back a very long way in history. We can trace it back to Copernicus. And in fact, some people call this the Copernicus Law instead, because he elucidated the idea earlier. But it was also seemingly independently recognized elsewhere. Al Makrizi of the Mamluk Empire of the 14th century Egypt is recognized for having come up with it as well. And if we go back further, much further in history, to the late 5th century BC, we find that Aristophanes notes the concept in his play, The Frogs. Although it's a relatively short phrase, bad money drives out good money, it may not be immediately clear what it actually means. I've heard it applied in a variety of situations and to a variety of topics, but in many cases, it's applied as sort of a broad, understood truism that some sort of bad behavior will overwhelm those who choose to play by the rules, which superficially hits the original meaning mark, but only just barely. The more exact meaning of Gresham's Law comes from the world of currency, and particularly, it applies to commodity money, coins made out of gold and silver and other precious metals, as opposed to fiat money, like most coins today, which are made out of base metals, and which serve as theoretical stand-ins for gold or silver or other precious materials that are purportedly stored elsewhere. When you have commodity money, gold coins, let's say, circulating throughout a society, there will almost certainly be someone looking to take advantage of the situation. And when gold coins were common, we saw a lot of debasing of coins, meaning coins that were said to be made up of a certain amount of gold, but which were, in fact, alloyed, mixed with some other less valuable base metal. Formal debasement was usually done by the government, or whomever else was issuing the coins, while less formal, easier-to-manage methods of debasement, like clipping, also called stemming, which involved actually snipping off tiny shreds of gold from around the rim of a coin, and then saving that gold for yourself and putting that coin, which is now made up of less gold, back into circulation. Those methods were easily managed by members of the public. An interesting side note, those ridges on the sides of many coins today are called reeded edges, and they were implemented to make clipping more evident. So if someone snipped some of the metal off a coin and then tried to pass it off to you as if it was a full weight coin, you would know, because the reading, those little ridges, would be visibly imperfect. So what we had in many societies was a bunch of money being issued that was sometimes because of the government, and sometimes because of people, and often both, actually less valuable than advertised. These coins were meant to be worth a specific amount of gold apiece, but many of them were impure or clipped to a lower weight. And however they were debased, these coins were now fundamentally less valuable than their pure, new, non-debased gold coin counterparts. But they were still meant to be honored as being worth the same. And in many cases, that was a rule that was legally enforced. You had to honor a particular gold coin, debased as it might be, as having the same value as a complete non-alloyed, non-clipped coin. So in practice, a coin of a certain face value, just like a dollar or a pound today, would have to be worth the same as any other coin of that face value when it's used for commercial purposes. So when we talk about bad money driving out good money, this is what we're referring to. When bad money, clipped or debased money, circulates freely, over time, people will stockpile. They will keep for themselves the good money, the complete non-debased coins that they receive, and they will prioritize passing off the bad money, the debased coins, to other people. They will be more likely to spend these coins that, although they are officially still worth the full amount, to them they're clearly worth less. They are made up of less valuable material. Over time, that good money is pretty much all locked away. 
saved somewhere, stockpiled by someone, and the market is flooded with, and almost entirely comprised of, bad money. So that bad money has chased out the good, which has been tucked away by all those who value it differently. Government decree be damned. This means that although these coins are purportedly worth a certain amount, which helps the government estimate how much money is in circulation, how much the local economy is worth, those estimates are almost certainly wrong. Because a debased gold coin is worth less than a non-debased gold coin, fundamentally. But our estimations are predicated on all of these gold coins being perfect, unmessed with units of value. We're making these measurements based on a theoretical enforced value, rather than inherent what's actually there value. Gresham's law is useful in understanding how bad behavior can create a cycle of attrition that over time ruins both our understanding of the value in circulation within our economy, but also how government mandate, in this case the idea that we will all honor coins of the same type, no matter what their quality as having the same value, how that pulls us away from a monetary system in which our tangible units of exchange mean something, and places us in a situation in which exchange based on absolute units of value becomes less feasible. This concept has an interesting application beyond currency and coinage. Consider that in a market where anything might be debased, from used cars to seemingly fresh fruit, anything might not be as good as it seems to be based on how it's promoted to us on the car lot or at the store. We buyers then have an incentive to treat all used cars as if they might be lemons, as if they might be terrible, and all fresh fruit as if they might be spruced up to look good on shelves, but are actually closer to their expiration date than they look. This, in turn, can incentivize sellers to focus their efforts on lower quality goods, because if we, the buyers, assume there's a possibility of being ripped off, we will be less likely to pay high prices for something that maybe is, maybe isn't a debased product. That there are bad used cars and bad fruit on the market, concealed as something of a higher quality, influences how we spend and what we are willing to buy. And that, in turn, influences the sellers, incentivizing them to buy lower quality stock. Because even if they invest in the good stuff, we buyers will not know for sure that it's good, and therefore may not be willing to pay the high prices required to sustain that higher level of quality. Over time, this spirals to the point where almost all products within a given economy are of very low quality, and yet all are treated the same as those with higher quality. Just as all those debased gold coins were treated as nice new full weight gold coins, even as the bad ones slowly kicked the good ones out of circulation. What I want to talk about today is what appears to be a modern application of Gresham's Law in a space that is very nearly optimized to make bad behavior, to make debasement possible, but which hasn't yet come up with an effective means of stopping or even slowing its shift in that direction. You're listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. Let's Know Things is proud to be an independent listener-supported show. If you are enjoying what you hear, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash letsknowthings. You can also find an array of other ways to contribute monetarily and non-monetarily at letsknowthings.com. And a very quick way to help out the show, if you are looking to do so, is to leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. Those things help a whole lot more than you might suspect. I also recently announced that I will be going on tour the third quarter of 2018. So if you're listening to this before or in the year following that, check out becomingtour.com to find out where I'll be headed next and consider coming out to say hello. And if you're listening to this in the very distant future, and there are still such things as tours, if we're not just teleporting everywhere or something like that, communicating by telepathy, then you might check out letsknowthings.com to see if I am currently on tour. If our robot overlords still allow that kind of thing. All right, let's get back to the show. Mm -hmm. 
The article I'd like to unspool today comes from The Atlantic, and it's entitled, Amazon May Have a Counterfeit Problem. This piece does a good job of outlining a massive and growing issue in the online retail space, while also pointing toward some of the junctures where it connects to other emerging issues in adjacent spaces. One of the main problems addressed in this piece is one that isn't new, that of the presence of counterfeit goods in a marketplace. This is something that's been going on for as long as there have been non-commodity goods, for as long as craftsmen would put their name on their creations. And it amped up as soon as brands became a thing. Commodity goods, like oats, were overtaken by the Baker Brothers quality oats. The Baker Brothers were able to charge more for a consistent high quality product, and their label provided that quality assurance to their customers, as opposed to the big barrel of undifferentiated oats that were being sold up till that point. In short order, though, competitors found that they could replicate the label, but not what it represented. Customers would spend more on supposedly high-quality goods, only to find that they received something of lower quality, which enriched the counterfeiter, stole business from that legitimate brand, and harmed the reputation of the brand in the eyes of the consumer. That same cycle continues around the world today. Some of my clearest memories from when I lived in Thailand involved walking through the marketplaces where there were throngs of street food vendors that were overshadowed by the sprawl of knockoff product purveyors. Everything from flip-flops to high-end electronics, many bearing world-renowned logos, were being sold at a quarter of the usual price, right there out in the open. And in most cases, you could haggle those prices even lower if you tried. These prices are so low because, first, these counterfeit manufacturers don't have the same marketing costs to pay to promote the brand like Apple or Sony or True Religion have to pay to raise awareness about and the public impression of their brand. They also lack the R&D, the research and development costs of larger brands, which tend to invest a great deal of money in fashion forecasting, new production methods, and inventing new concepts and products and designs. And, of course, they are able to charge substantially lower prices because the quality of the materials used and the quality of the production methods utilized are generally far inferior to what you would find in a legitimate product from these brands. This type of open-air market is easier to run and profit from in some parts of the world than others, and there have been crackdowns, like the one that began in New York City in 2013, which sent their then-thriving fake designer handbag market underground and behind closed doors, making it far smaller and less accessible than it was in the preceding years. But being able to take this kind of market online changed everything. And being able to take it to the most popular and trusted marketplace on the open internet, in this case meaning outside of China, which is Amazon, dramatically increased the scope and scale of the problem. There are cheap versions of just about any product you can imagine, available somewhere in the world if you look hard enough. And you can increasingly find these goods distributed all over the place, filling in gaps that may have previously been unfilled or filled by higher quality products. Often these shoddily made goods are sold as white-labeled cheap souvenirs with the logo for a tourist attraction or a school printed on them. An undifferentiated good in terms of quality, the same as what's sold at that other attraction or school in the next town over, but somewhat differentiated by what's been printed on it. There are also blank label goods of this kind that are sold by the companies that produce them and which do the printing for those schools and tourist attractions, sold by the third-party distributors that work with those producers, and they're sold on websites like AliExpress, which is owned by the Chinese technology conglomerate Alibaba, which is itself a bit like Amazon in that it sprawls across a great many industries and is utterly massive. But since 2015, Alibaba has also had higher sales and profit numbers than all U.S. retailers, including Walmart and Amazon and eBay, combined. 
So AliExpress and similar entities, which are often owned by larger tech and manufacturing companies in China, produce gobs of this stuff. And it then filters out into the world via various channels. And all these sales are legitimate. They just sometimes compete with generally better quality alternatives that are produced elsewhere. What's become troublesome for brands, though, is that these same production mechanisms, these same factories and distribution systems, are allowing these Chinese manufacturing companies to make not just cheap alternatives, but legit ripoffs of patented, trademarked, and copyrighted products. They're not just making cheaper jeans. They're making jeans that look exactly like true religion jeans, logo and all. And what's worse, and this is why many people in this space consider Amazon to be a huge part of the problem, in many cases, these faux-branded jeans are being sold on Amazon and other online retail platforms as the brand that they are ripping off. So if you buy a pair of True Religion jeans or an Apple-branded laptop charger, what you receive may have the right logo and the right packaging, but the quality of the product may be way off from what you would expect. And the money you paid may be going to one of these counterfeiting companies instead of to the owners of that brand. The reasons Amazon gives for why things are set up the way they are, for why you might get a counterfeit product instead of the real deal, are first, they're just a platform, and they're not responsible for what happens on their marketplace. Second, in order to make sure their customers get the lowest prices, they have to ensure multiple sources can compete to provide the same products. And third, it would be impossible for them to screen every item, or even 1% of the items that they sell through their service. They do technically handle many of the goods that they sell and ship, but their processes are so heavily automated, even the portions that require human labor are impersonal and algorithm-guided, that they don't even have those hands-on moments that would allow them to check these products over. And beyond that, how could they possibly be expected to tell a near-perfect knockoff from a legitimate pair of jeans? How could they be experts on all of the product categories that they sell? And if they were to try, how could they do so in a way that allowed them to keep shipping things so quickly, efficiently, and cheaply? Looping back around to that first point, that they're just a platform, and therefore not responsible for what happens on their site, this argument might sound familiar if you've been paying attention to all the hubbub around Facebook and Google and other sites that have been increasingly publicly called to task over some of the horrible stuff that's been published on their platform and some of the data-related abuses that have been perpetrated using their tools. And this is actually a pretty good defense on Amazon's part. And I know it may not be immediately clear why that's the case, because it seems like an example of a corporation refusing to take responsibility for something for which they're clearly responsible, and that maybe they're just intentionally penny-pinching or something, because they can. But bear with me for a moment here, and I will try to explain with relative concision why it's actually important that they are able to say this and have that argument taken seriously. Title V of the Telecommunications Act of 1996 is often called the Communications Decency Act of 1996, and a section of the Communications Decency Act of 1996, more specifically Section 230, states that, quote, no provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider, end quote. What this means in non-jargon is that if you have a website and someone publishes something on that website, you are not legally considered to be the person who published or spoke those words. This is vital and has been since the beginning of the web, because imagine if you had a website on the early internet with a comment section where people could sign your guest book, which is what comment sections were called back then. What if someone wrote in this comment section on your website, I'm going to kill the president? Would it be fair and just for you, as the owner of that website, to be held responsible for those words, to be investigated by the Secret Service because some rando from the internet thought it would be funny to write such a thing? Probably not. And what was important back then 
became increasingly vital with the emergence of what became known as Web 2.0, the more modern version of the internet that evolved approximately between the years 1999 and 2006, where paying for things online became feasible, blogs became a thing, early social networks started evolving into the beginning stages of their more modern incarnations. Basically, everything became more dynamic and interactive and media-rich. All of these services and new capabilities were in some way dependent on the back-and-forth ability of the web. The internet was no longer a system that allowed a few enthusiast broadcasters to post things while everyone else browsed. It was a system where we would visit websites and interact with those websites, leaving our own mark clicking on things, altering the website itself by having been there, by writing text, posting photos, uploading videos, and so on. The internet, as it exists today, and essentially all the useful things we can do on the internet, is dependent on Section 230. If the owner of a site or platform was legally responsible for everything posted or published in some way on their site, there would not be that many sites, not to mention useful ones, that could afford to exist. They would all be so prone to legally punishable misbehavior that no one would bother investing in them, and they wouldn't have evolved to the point where they are today. The web would be filled with static sites containing no interaction, uploading, or user-generated content capabilities of any kind. So as far as excuses go, Amazon saying that they are a platform, a place for people to interact and do things, and are not themselves responsible for the myriad misbehaviors that can take place in such a space, that's actually a very defensible statement in a legal sense, even if not always in terms of public sentiment. And while it's easy to understand why the public would turn against such a concept in very specific outrage-of-the-day style circumstances, it would also almost certainly be disastrous for the state of the internet if Section 230 were to be weakened or overturned, removing this defense from Amazon and Facebook and Google's playbook, but also everyone else's. Notably, this is a big part of why nonprofit organizations like the ACLU, the Electric Frontier Foundation, and the Wikimedia Foundation joined the Sex Workers Outreach Project in opposition to the recent SESTA, or Stop Enabling Sex Traffickers Act, also called FOSTA, or the Allow States and Victims to Fight Online Sex Trafficking Act, that were recently combined into a unified FOSTA-SESTA package bill and passed in the House of Representatives and Senate with bipartisan support before being signed into law by President Trump on April 11th of 2018. Based on the titles of these bills, their passing would seem to be a big win. I mean, who isn't against sex trafficking? But the sex worker community was almost universally against it, as it made their work a whole lot more dangerous, and because it arguably pushed sex trafficking underground rather than exposing it, which in turn made it more difficult to combat. Basically, it's a law that makes life more difficult for sex workers, and a little easier in some ways for sex traffickers. And the reason those freedom of speech defending groups joined the fight against this act was that the FOSTA-SESTA package seems primed to do some significant damage to the standing of Section 230. Basically, it allows law enforcement to punish websites like Backpage, where a lot of sex work services were offered, and they can do this by creating an exception to Section 230 in certain circumstances, opening the door for other circumstances in which it can be bypassed in the future. So this law, which seems very focused on something that ostensibly should be a good thing, may in fact be not just harmful in terms of what it was meant to accomplish, but also the first major salvo fired against free speech on the internet and the ability of sites like Amazon and Facebook and Wikipedia to function freely without the constant threat of being sued out of existence because of something that some random person posts on their site. 
The second argument, that Amazon needs to allow multiple distributors to offer the same product in order to guarantee low prices, is also somewhat defensible, though it's arguably less so, due to the emergence and popularity of sometimes legit, sometimes pseudo-legit drop shipping business models that have developed into an entire exploding industry of drop shipping. I remember hearing about the world of drop shipping when I first started traveling full time back in 2009. A lot of people who wanted to be digital nomads were looking for ways to generate what was being called passive income. And one such model involved finding a supplier of cheap goods, usually in China or Vietnam or some other location where they had inexpensive labor and could churn out inexpensive products fast. And then you focused your attention on branding that product and selling it online. So maybe you'd set up a website where you would promote a little pocket charger for your phone. And you'd have them print up a nice digital nomad-oriented logo on it. And you would buy these chargers for a dollar a piece in bulk. And then sell them one by one for ten dollars a piece through your website. The secret sauce here that made this type of income passive was that when someone placed an order, the folks who made the product, or maybe some intermediary, would hold on to the product for you in a warehouse and would even do the packaging, would print up the instruction manual for you. They would sell you the product, turn it into something custom for you, and then ship it for you out to the customer. So you would be able to sell cheap stuff for more than you bought it for to people around the world, and you would never have to touch the product. Boom, pseudo passive income. This model became a lot easier to manage with the emergence of social media, which made the branding process a lot simpler and cheaper and allowed outreach to a far larger audience than a blog or Google ads could offer you. But even better, Amazon's Fulfillment by Amazon service allows you to use them as your intermediary. So you can have your cheap Chinese goods sent to Amazon. Amazon keeps those goods in their warehouses, stocked and available in their catalog, ready to be sold, and you pay a relatively small fee to have them be your go-to labeler, shipper, and payment processor, which allows you to reach their astoundingly large audience while also gaining the credibility that comes with selling through a major trusted retailer. All of which might be fine and good, if these drop-shipped knockoffs were kept in a separate bin. But Amazon allows multiple retailers to sell the same branded product, and each seller can offer that product at a different price. I bought a spatula on Amazon the other day, and there were nine different entities offering the exact same product through Amazon's store. A seller called Big Kitchen, another called Michigan Sports and Outdoor Incorporated, Tundra Restaurant Supply, Wasserstrom Restaurant Supply, Chicago Knife Works, Data Alchemy, Catering Online, Chef's Choice, and Amazon itself. The price ranged from $16.49 with free prime shipping included on the low end, all the way up to $40 plus $10.29 shipping on the high end. This system is useful because in addition to allowing some sellers to offer used, refurbished, or open box products alongside the new ones, it also allows companies which are able to get cheaper stock for whatever reason of a particular product to pass those savings on to the customer, thereby out-competing all of those other sellers. This means there's an incentive to keep profit margins low, which benefits the consumer. This system becomes treacherous for that same reason, however, because although many of these purveyors are legit and are selling the actual product that's advertised, in this case a spatula that is made by Victorinox, in other cases, some of these sellers will say they have the real Victorinox made good, but when that good is purchased, they will drop ship in something similar, but not the real deal. It'll look the same and have the right logo and packaging, but it will be shoddily made, or in some cases will have photocopied instructions instead of the glossy guide that is usually included with the actual brand-produced product. I've actually been the recipient of a knockoff Apple laptop charger, which I purchased on Amazon through Apple's store 
on Amazon, and which could only be distinguished from its legitimate counterpart if you cracked the thing open and compared the quality of a few of the small electrical safety components that are tucked in amongst all the other carbon copy pieces that are found in legit Apple chargers. Everything else was exactly the same. So a lot of these counterfeits are tricky to identify, even if you know what you're looking for, and even if you seem to be making your purchase through a legitimate source. This is something that Amazon has been called out on for many years, and though they say that they're doing what they can to handle it, that they have methods of rooting out counterfeiters using their internal systems, it's still a massive problem, especially within some industries. There are a lot of products made by smaller manufacturers in particular that are being crippled by counterfeits. And while companies like Mercedes-Benz, which recently tore in to Amazon for allowing and profiting from the sale of counterfeit Mercedes-Benz parts on their platform, these smaller makers don't always have the leverage or resources to take a huge conglomerate like Amazon to court for it. And what's more, a lot of these smaller companies are terrified that if they speak up too loudly, Amazon might boot them off their service completely, which would create an entirely new problem. A recent blog post by the founder of a company called Elevation Labs outlined how a well-regarded and popular under-desk headphone holder that they make has been repeatedly and blatantly counterfeited, and with those counterfeit units then sold openly on Amazon on their product page. I will link to that blog post in the show notes. It's worth a read, as it demonstrates how this process works, but also how creators who find themselves in this situation are often unable to get Amazon to do anything about it. A Chinese company basically reverse-engineered this product, creating new molds that they got just a little bit wrong, copying the logo, which they also got wrong, using fake 3M adhesives, which were not of the same quality, and reduced the overall quality of the product's hold on the desk, and then photocopied and reprinted the packaging materials, even going so far as to cover up the SKU, the product code, on these materials with a giant sticker to conceal it. This post went viral and eventually got Amazon's attention, which is documented in the updates on the post. But then, also documented in those updates, is how three days after that original Chinese company and their product were booted, another one stepped in to take their place, creating the exact same problem once more. The author of that post also notes that the one brand for which Amazon does not allow that type of purveyor competition, for which there are no third-party sellers, is their own Amazon Basics brand, which is immensely convenient for Amazon and kind of isn't great for their argument that this system is what's best for the makers of things who use their platform. So this is a widespread thing that impacts creators of products of all shapes and sizes, but it's also intertwined with the overall Amazon system tightly enough that the company is clearly having trouble figuring out how they might remedy it without also hamstringing the positive aspect of that model, that it keeps prices low and has helped establish an easy-to-use platform upon which anyone can sell any type of product rather than one to which only big companies have access and on which only a limited range of products are available. That fear harbored by creators of being kicked off Amazon is a pretty potent defense for Amazon against being called out too strongly on these points. And it also makes clear the double-edged nature of this conflict. On one hand, yes, it truly sucks that these counterfeiters can so easily play the system and essentially steal money and customers from people who put a lot of time and effort and resources into building solid products and respectable brands. At the same time, many of these people, these companies, would not be able to do business, maybe wouldn't even have a business, without the very system about which they are now complaining. So in effect, the system is screwing them out of some of the benefits that that system has granted them, along with, of course, a great many others that they've built for themselves, but still, it's a somewhat strange situation. Part of this conflict can be traced back beyond just Amazon and other online retailers to the creation mechanisms 
that are now available to everyone, rather than just the fortunate few, as has often been the case in the past within many markets. You and I can now create goods, even physical goods, on scale, to whatever scale the market will bear, and the processes that grant us that power also empower bad actors within the marketplace. And this reality really does reach far and wide. Because of cheap print-on-demand services, including those offered by Amazon subsidiary CreateSpace, thieves can actually buy a book from Amazon, copy the content of that book, paste it into a new document, export that document as a PDF, and then make that PDF available as a paperback copy of that stolen book, printing it through CreateSpace or through one of the countless other print-on-demand services that drop ship to Amazon's catalog. A recent example of exactly that scenario was documented on the ExtremeTech.com blog by the editor-in-chief for the site, who is also the author of a book called Breakout, How Atari 8-Bit Computers Defined a Generation. His book's contents were copied word for word, and the thief clearly just used a find and replace tool to swap out his name for the name of the new, probably fake, author name that was subbed in. And as a result of that lazy replacement method, the copy in the book still claims that this new, fake author is the editor-in-chief of ExtremeTech.com, and that the book is published by the same publishing company as the real book, which it clearly isn't. Additionally, the layout of the text inside the book is just comically bad. Some pages seem to have somehow glitched and have printed sentences vertically with one letter per line, while other pages that were originally left blank in the real book are marked this page left blank in the fake copy. So elements of this story are kind of funny, and the author of that book seems to have laughed it off, but it also absolutely sucks. I mean, imagine if you spent years, potentially, writing a book, only to have that book's contents stolen, given a new author, a slightly different title, and a new horribly designed cover, then imagine that this bizarro version of your book is listed right next to yours on one of the most trafficked online retailers in existence. You can see why this might cause some frustration, despite how beneficial these tools can also be. It's worth noting here, as a quick tangent, that very often the difference between a product that is counterfeit and a product that's off-brand or generic brand or store brand is primarily a legal difference. Generic drugs are blatant copies of existing branded drugs, and they can be sold for far less money than the branded versions because the generic companies churning out these pills and treatments don't have to pay all the branding, marketing, and R&D costs associated with developing a new product of that kind. This is why drug companies are provided with periods of time after they develop a new patented medication during which only they can legally produce and sell it. Now, this setup sucks if you need one of these drugs, and it's only available for the cost of a new car. But the logic behind that decision makes sense through that framing, even if it's not always situationally convenient, or even seemingly moral, through other lenses. But for the same reasons that it would be a true bummer to have the book you wrote, or the gadget you invented, copied and then sold right next to the version that you make, the version in which you invested a whole lot of time and effort and resources, it would probably suck to have a drug you developed immediately copied by another company whose only investment is manufacturing the product, while you foot all the bills and take all the risks to develop it. For that same reason, we have copyright law to protect intellectual property, so that, ideally at least, we don't produce a book or video game and immediately have someone else come along, scoop up the ideas, and sell a knockoff copy right next to the one that we worked so hard and sacrificed so much to produce. Many of these laws do not apply in the same way or are either ignored or not well implemented overseas. But that is how it's supposed to work in theory. So you could argue that the increased global interconnectedness of our economy also plays a role in this issue, in addition to everything else. Stemming off of that original main story about infringement 
and counterfeit that is enabled by and baked into the current way that Amazon manages things are two other pretty big concepts. The first is that Amazon and companies like it are increasingly serving as linchpins for entire facets of the economy. Too big to fail is not always an accurate statement, but the number of consumers who have come to rely on Amazon for access to goods that they wouldn't otherwise be able to find, especially at such low prices, and the number of businesses, both large and small, that have become reliant on Amazon for a majority of their income sometimes, is staggering. As of late 2017, about half of all tangible goods sold on Amazon come from third parties, companies using services like Fulfillment by Amazon to sell spatulas and instant pots and books, both legitimate and not so legitimate. That's a whole lot of transactions. What this means is that on one hand, Amazon is one of the better things to ever happen to businesses, extending their reach and allowing even small fry players down to the scale of individual authors like me to sell what we make to a worldwide audience and to do so with more or less the click of a button. It's all pretty simple and accessible. And consumers, as I mentioned, have benefited just as much if not more. On the other hand, though, when something this big and important has a glaring flaw, there's not a whole lot anyone outside the behemoth of a company can do about it. Customers can complain, and politicians can posture, but who's going to mess with something so big and powerful and useful, and arguably important? Who's going to risk poking that bear? And who can guarantee that any forced changes would make things better to begin with? Amazon, for better and for worse, has become something close to a public utility in the space of retail and shipping and less related to this topic but important to understand for context in the world of online services through their Amazon Web Services department. So just as it's proven to be a bureaucratic nightmare to try to make changes to the U.S. national power grid to make it more efficient and effective and smart, any attempt to rewire Amazon, to alleviate its flaws, will be cumbersome, time-consuming, and almost certainly, at least in the short term, relatively fruitless. The other sub-story here is that as we gain access to more tools, both things we can own and things to which we have access, our ability to counterfeit and pirate things will increase parallel to our ability to create new things. As our ability to distribute music around the world increased due to new compressed file formats and the connectivity afforded by the internet, so too did our ability to pirate music. As our ability to publish books on demand by accessing services like CreateSpace improves, so too improves our ability to copy and paste and reprint someone else's work. The same is true across the board in any space you might consider. And this means that the problem faced by Amazon is not a unique problem, and it's not a problem that is likely to go away. In fact, the opposite is almost certainly true. The trajectory on this collection of issues is an upward-sloping hockey stick. We're entering a period, then, where our capacity to create may be outgrowing our system of value exchange and property management. You could recognize that and decide that it's time to implement new restrictions to lock down some of these technologies to ensure that we're not stepping on toes and accidentally or purposefully stealing from creators, that we're not hurting shareholders. You could also decide that we need a new system of value exchange and property management, something post-capitalism, maybe, or some fresh riff on capitalism that takes this new reality into more complete consideration. Something that recognizes our new powers and amplifies them, rather than restricting them. Something that reconsiders our system for such things, from first principles, rather than based on existing principles. Both extreme paths, and all the gray paths in between them, are equally possible, I think. There are a lot of legitimate, understandable ways of perceiving and responding to this new reality. And part of the challenge that we face today is trying to understand what it all means and where it might go next, having only caught the tiniest of glimpses of what waits for us around the next corner, what new abilities we will acquire, 
and what that might mean for our ever-shifting social and economic fabric. If you are enjoying Let's Know Things, consider leaving a quick review up on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You might also consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash let's know things. And you can also contribute via PayPal or Venmo or whatever is easiest for you via the options at let's know things.com. A huge thanks to everyone who has already contributed in some way already. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Today, I'd like to recommend an app or a game, I guess, but it's also an app that is available for iOS and Android, but also for Windows and Mac and Linux. And this game is called Reigns, R-E-I-G-N-S. And this is an incredibly strange game, I think is the best way to describe it. It's a game where the user interface is almost like being on Tinder, where you swipe to the left or to the right, but you swipe based on what cards that pop up tell you. And when you swipe, it's kind of like a choose your own adventure sort of decision that you're making. So a card will pop up telling you a piece of information or somebody will be on that card and they are telling you something or asking you a question and you answer that question or make that decision by swiping one way or the other. Now that is a deceptively simple way of working your way through what is a hilarious and strange kind of fantasy adventure where you are the king of a very bizarre fantasy land and you are doing your best to manage basically the church, the people, the military, and your kingdom's wealth. And if your score for any of these four variables moves too high or too low, then you will die in some kind of creative and interesting way. And the next game that you play will be your heir, your descendant will be the next king that you are playing as. So this game kind of builds upon itself over time as you play this entire dynasty in this fantasy realm and different things happen and you have different scenarios and subplots and very strange main characters. But it's one of the more compelling storytelling mechanisms that I've ever seen. And it's a little bit hard to get into if you don't know what to expect because it's so different. But I really appreciate how they managed to work so much creativity and interestingness and actual storytelling into a format that's so simple. Now there's a new version of this game that's out apparently now, which I have not played, but the original one I know for sure is a whole lot of fun and you can usually find it for a couple of bucks on the iOS store, on the Android store, on Steam, I think, if you want to get it for Windows or Mac or Linux, if you get the chance. This is a whole lot of fun to play. It's very interesting, and it's the perfect game I have found to play. Even if you're somebody who doesn't whip out their smartphone a whole lot, when you are waiting for an airplane or sitting on a bus or doing something else where you have five minutes to kill, Reigns, R-E-I-G-N-S, is an excellent option. You can find out more about me and my work at colin.io. You can find the show notes for this episode and every episode of the podcast at letsnotethings.com. You can find my blog at exilelifestyle.com, and you can find out the details as they are locked into place, including the 25 or so cities that I will be visiting on my upcoming tour at becomingtour.com. It'd be great to see you there if you are in North America and somewhere on my path of travel. Feel free to reach out and say hello on the social networks. I am at Colin is my name on Instagram and Twitter and YouTube and so on. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Colin Wright, and I will talk to you again next week. Mm-hmm.